Okay, mic is working. I apologize in advance for any static for my hair. I keep forgetting this every single time. So, hi everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be here today. Uh, how are you all doing? Good. Good. Let's try that again. How are you all doing? Good. Yes, great. Um, similar to stuff, I'm actually going to warm you guys up a little because um, I had some questions of myself. So, who here has traveled from another country to be here? That's actually quite exciting. Me too, as well. And who has seen the latest Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, recently? A few, a few. Great. Um, I thought it was really interesting. It was a very, very long film, but there's a lot in there. And what I find funny is, because I kind of work in VFX and film now, is all the movie posters that you see around. I don't know if you've spotted it. I've been told there are 13 different movie posters that the designers of Seven Principles transformed into somehow a punny joke on Swift and iOS. Um, I think it's pretty cool. So I would say like try and find them and, and tweet them or something and give the designers some love. Now, who's already had a shot at Swift UI? That's a good chunk, but not all of you, so that is great. Um, I don't know what workshop to go to because I'm interested in all of them because obviously Daniel will be covering that. Has anyone written any games? Right, Dory's going to have a great audience in his workshop. <laughs> and who here has gotten stuck in voiceover mode before? Okay, a few. A few. I definitely have. Um, and it has given me a great appreciation for accessibility. So Buster's workshop should be great too. Now, as we kick this conference off, that will teach us about the latest and greatest in Swift and iOS. I'm honored to talk to you about something that I hope will serve you in conjunction with that. It's a little less about me telling you um, kind of how things work, like bits of API, and a bit more me asking you questions that I think are worth thinking about. Now, in this talk, I've reserved ample time for Q&A, so, and I would love to turn this into a discussion, which is why I started earlier, so you're a bit warmed up now, so hopefully you won't be dead silent by the end of this talk. Um, and please note down any questions that come up as we go through this. So we're here at SwiftConf to strive to better our skills, but ultimately, what are we writing this code for? What is it supposed to do, and what change does it seek to make? Why must we all get into the business of storytelling as well as developing world-class applications? So my name is Maxime, as stuff is introduced, and I'm a nanny on Twitter. <laughs> and I'll be covering why, as people, we are drawn to stories, why we must tell them, and how we can do so. At Autodesk, I'm essentially a professional visual storyteller. In terms of fancy titles, I'm a principal design technologist, which basically means I'm an engineer that is embedded in a design team. Equally, I teach women entrepreneurs how to scale their business using technology. And in both cases, I bring ideas to life. Now, interestingly enough, the product that I work on at Autodesk, Shotgun, helps creative studios all over the world bring their ideas to life. And our clients have been working on very exciting projects, some that you may have seen around. So this got me thinking, why do stories play such a large part in human society and history, especially considering we've been telling them for thousands and thousands of years? Especially when you consider that we repeat basically the same few plots over and over and over again. Even this talk, what I'm talking to you right now is nothing new. You could Google storytelling and get a bunch of TED Talks that are probably better um, that can tell you all about this. But stories make us feel something. They connect us. Because it allows us to relate to one another in a way that few other things do. Suddenly, facts are no longer quite as important. For example, we all know Mount Everest is bloody tall. That's a fact. But when we hear someone explain their arduous journey up, we fully grasp the fact that it is so large and what that means for people like you and I. It's the combination of new and interesting ideas presented in a way that allows us to connect, feel, and empathize that make us come back to stories time and time again. So let me say that again. Stories connect us to each other and make us feel and empathize with what others are going through. Now hidden within that is a rather special nuance, which is that stories have the power to change other stories. And this is really, really huge. We all tell ourselves every day 
different narratives. Some of it are true, some of it are false, some of it is positive, and some of it is negative. But it is our worldview, and it makes perfect sense to each and every one of us individually. So what happens when we're presented with facts that break that narrative? Instinctively, we reject it. If we're self-aware enough, we can reason with ourselves and accept a new truth, but we can't deny that changing an existing story for ourselves is tough unless we can replace stories with new ones. One of my favorite examples here is a wildly successful gay rights activist and Oscar-winning screenwriter, Dustin Lance Black. He was raised in a conservative, military Mormon family in the south of the US, in Texas. Lance was incredibly close to his family and loved the community that he grew up in. However, he always knew and feared the day that he had to tell them the truth about his um, sexual orientation. When he did come out to his mom, it didn't go great. It wasn't terrible, but she struggled. However, this changed, and the turning point was when she flew out to California to come visit his graduation at UCLA. Now, at this point, he hadn't told his friends that his mom hadn't accepted him as a gay man, and he also hadn't told his mom that the majority of his friends were part of the LGBTQ community. So they had this big dinner for his graduation at his apartment, and it was because he had said nothing that his friends assumed that his mom accepted him. And to them, that was amazing. She was essentially a saint. This was before Will and Grace, before Ellen, before any mainstream or public support was a common thing. So they felt they could talk to her. And so they poured out their hearts and told her everything. And being a good Southern mom, she sat there and listened and nodded. After everyone left, she sat down with him and talked to him about meeting his friends. She had tears in her eyes and held him so incredibly tight in her arms. And when you hear him tell this story, it's hard not to be moved to tears yourself. So this happened because that night, she had heard personal stories of being rejected by parents and their family, the issues that they were facing, the fears they had, and the pain that they were feeling. These stories, in just a few hours, broke down a lifetime of myths and lies that she had been told. And that's one of the most powerful abilities that we have, because stories change people's minds, and as a result, change our lives. So that's all well and nice, you might say, but what does that have to do with software development? Because at the end of the day, that's what we do. There are multiple ways to tell a story, but few work as well as being able to see what you are being told. Without visual or tangible aids, it falls on the listener to imagine what is possible. But when it's real, there's no getting around it. You are truly immersed. This is why films, animations, and comics do so well. And we as engineers have one of the best suited skills for this purpose. We have the ability to program and create something that wasn't there before. We bring ideas to life. So what are your ideas? You might be concerned with the architecture of your code base or the security of an app that you're working on. You might be creating a Swift podcast or a fantastic open source library. Take a minute to think about a project that you're working on currently. When you tell others about it or you discuss and debate the pros and cons, are you using facts or are you using stories? How are you allowing others to relate? And how are you listening and showing up with curiosity? And taking it a step further, how can you prototype it and make it a reality for others to see? Yes, we all have the ability to make great apps, and we can harness that to demonstrate our argument. But the delivery is half the work. Or else we're just presenting facts visually. Look. This looks better. It behaves better, don't you think? So I'd like to walk you through some of the key elements of stories that you can use to string up a successful narrative around your work. Now, this is where there are many different experts in the field. Pixar, for example, a small, humble person in the world of storytelling, will list 22 components of great storytelling. Others range from three to eight. At the end of the day, the exact framework doesn't quite matter. And I like to think along the lines of these following three things. You have the underdog, the hardship, and the victory. 
The underdog is a personification of who or what we are rooting for. This could be our user, it could be the success of our app, or our business. Either way, it's the person that we empathize with and care for. So when this underdog, the protagonist, encounters a hardship, we feel for them. We want to help, we want to see what they do, and how they will overcome this difficulty and succeed. The hardship is the issue or problem that our main character can't deal with right off the bat. It could be a bug, it could be a security issue, a UX problem, you name it. But at a glance, it seems disastrous and threatens to throw a plan or happy status quo off kilter. But then comes the moment of sweet victory in the end. Due to a crafty or ingenious solution, a moment of luck, the turning point, our hero succeeds and achieved a new and improved reality, for they are never the same again. So we have the underdog, the hardship, and the victory. And you can use these different elements to narrate your work and show and make people feel what the impact of your work could be. Now, I know I said three things, but I'll give you a bonus one. If you want to add some true doom and gloom, there is a fourth component worth considering. That's the alternative. What happens if they don't do it? Failure. What happens if your lead doesn't win and if they cannot overcome the hardship? What's the alternative? Stories change people's minds. As a result, it changes our lives. And you can start small. A few years ago at SwiftKey, as Steph mentioned, um, we were starting from scratch on iPhone when Apple opened up support for third-party keyboards. Now, the entire company expected us to essentially recreate SwiftKey Android for iOS, as this was an existing product that worked very successfully. This is the layout of the numpad on Android. Now you might instinctively know where this will go wrong, but the rest of the team couldn't quite see that. And rightly so. They've been using this every single day, so to them this version is easy. It's intuitive. It's as easy as pie. However, I had great concerns about shipping this to our iOS users, and I pleaded with key stakeholders, but to no avail. So I put it to the test. I prototyped this layout in the first week of iOS development when we were going through our first iteration and scheduled usability research with iPhone users. And we asked them to type everyday sentences, such as, hey mom, I'm running a bit late, I missed the 11 o'clock train. Looks like I can take the next one at 11.23, so I should be at yours for two. Is that okay? See you soon. Now, of course, these all had numbers, punctuation, and special symbols in them. And we recorded their struggle their frustration, and their complaints. By the end, they were quite ready to throw the phone out of the window, to be honest. And this is that hardship. We then presented the problem to our stakeholders and said, this is what our users, the ones we are trying to help succeed, are going through. And this is, quite honestly, what failure will look like. But we can do something about that. We can lead them to victory, and that sounds very grand, but you know, all the elements are there, by just making a very simple change. And within less than five minutes, we got the okay to recreate the iOS layout, which ships with the default layout that you have in iOS. Numbers at the top, symbols below. Now, I could have told a different story. I could have mentioned muscle memory. I could have talked about cognitive load, brought up session length and uninstall rates, and used these facts to try and convince them that it was a bad idea. But that wouldn't have helped it was through storytelling and painting the picture and showing what people struggle with that I was able to change their minds because stories change people's minds and as a result, our lives. And you can start small or you can go big. Changing people's lives from a small action is something that can happen. The fact that Stephen Hawking uses SwiftKey's prediction technology, for example. But that's a story for another time. And once you keep an eye out, you realize there are plenty of stories to be told. So when you're working on an open source library, for example, you can define what it does and why it's great. But how does it help your fellow developers, the people that you're rooting for? How does it help them succeed? How does it allow them to overcome hardships and be victorious? How do you market 
in a way, to the rest of your team the need to go off and refactor a section of the code base? And how do you advocate and celebrate your users by ensuring that the UX is excellent? Remember the underdog, hardship, and the victory, and the alternative. You can use these to still tell your stories, because stories change people's minds, and as a result, our lives. Ultimately, what is the change that you are seeking to make? And how can you present it in such a way that changes other people's minds? How will you use your ability to program great code to spark curiosity and an exchange of ideas? What story will you tell? And how will you make people feel? Now, I know I've posed a lot of questions, and I'd love to open up the floor and discuss this with you in a minute and also over the next two days. Already just before, I've had some great conversations with people um, where in the way that we work and the apps that we shift, obviously there are often um, conflicts. So I don't know if you have any examples or ideas that you've been working on, but I would love to discuss it with you all. Have a wonderful SwiftConf, and thank you all. And I hope the mic will last. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have to take the other one. I will try without the... I'm, I'm that kind of person who believe in, in maybe this will work now. <laughs> Otherwise, I will just... All right. Thank you. Um, any questions? Uh, um, I myself always have questions, so, um, but I, I give you the priority, obviously. So if anybody has questions, just let me know. Um, Oh, sorry. All right. So wait, 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 wait. You have to wait for the mic. Otherwise, people watching at the videos afterwards, they won't hear anything. Yeah, my question is simply, uh, how do you do that styling story, uh, telling story? Sorry. Um, which tools do you use? How do you communicate? Do you write a text in Word or, or some other tool in Pages, or do you write emails? I saw your very impressive illustrations. Is, are they part of the storytelling? That's a good question. Um, they can be. It depends on where your skills lie. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I usually think, indeed, visual media is the most important thing that you can do. So a few ways I've done it is by prototyping different examples. So I would branch off our app in this case and create a ver variation of those layouts and get them to use, be used by different people and then record people using them, for example. And in that kind of short way, people can see what the change is and they can see the reaction to the change. And then you narrate on top of that what exactly has happened. And that often is a pretty powerful package, if you will. But say that you work remote, you can do the same thing. You can record your screen or your phone and a voiceover and say, this is something that I'm not sure about. I noticed that this is happening, and instead I think we could do this. But by talking about it in the mind and the eyes of whoever will be using that, and that doesn't have to be a user, right? Like I mentioned, it could be fellow developers, it could be someone else. But by trying to find out for yourself, who exactly am I serving? Who's the underdog? Where is this going wrong? What is that hardship? And what is the success that I'm seeking to make for them, that victory? By going through those different points, other people hopefully should be able to relate. And you can also type that out in text in Slack if need be. But usually what I do is I record a voiceover and I kind of post that there. Does that help? Do you have an example in mind? or? No, it helps. Uh, it gives me more concrete ideas how okay. this really works. Thank you for answering my question. Sure. You can give the mic directly over there. Um, Hi. Uh, first off, thank you. That was a lovely story, in fact. Um, how do you approach people who uh, themselves do prefer facts over stories and, well, um, are vehement about that? Right, so this is a great question. We were actually talking about this earlier today. Um, one of the things about storytelling is to be able to put yourself in the mind of that underdog, right, that user, or user in the greater context, not necessarily of your service or app. And if it is such that they are the type of person that prefers facts, why is that? 
What is their worldview that creates that in such a way? Because everything we do makes sense for us, right? In a grander scheme, you can ask yourself as well, why are people right to buy from the competitor? Because to them, that makes sense. So the person that you're talking to, yes, they prefer facts, but why? And what is that? And what are they feeling? And how can I relate to them? What is their hardship such that I can effectively tell this story? Because it is true, whoever you're talking to has to be able to relate to the story that you're telling. If it is too different, if it doesn't string across certain emotions that we all feel, it becomes much harder to bring them on board with that vision. But the reason storytelling is effective most of the time is because we can all relate to those feelings. And this is why they've been working for years and years and years. But it makes sense to have to think about who am I talking to and how can I, what are the things that you believe they can relate with so you can guide them and bring them on board with your journey? Thanks so much. Sure. All right, so can I have the mic? Yeah, okay. Um, somebody else? Otherwise, I'm on the, yeah, in the front. <laughs> He's going all the way to the outside. <laughs> Manu, you can make it. And now, that's taking a shortcut. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on how you can make it more effective for people to hear the story you're telling and hear the point behind it? Yes. Um, start with, don't tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> I know that sounds really obvious, but I think as soon as we feel like we're there to be convinced, we shut down. And we're like, no, no, no. Because, we, again, we have a mindset and a view of the world, and it holds true for us. If that crumbles, what is real and what isn't, right? When you think about it psychologically. So people have very strong convictions and reasons to hold on to what they believe is right. So facts on facts, or kind of saying, no, I'm right because of this, or the other person says, I'm right because of that, even if you word it very nicely, doesn't really get you anywhere. So one of the things I try, and it doesn't always work, I will give you that, is lead by example and curiosity. Allow them to tell their story. And then transition into yours. And start with a gentle lead up of like, you know, again, when you look at stories, you set a scene, you set the narrative, you introduce the main characters, you introduce the problems, and you guide someone step by step through that. Oftentimes, we don't have time, right? We come into meetings, we're conversing over Slack, we work remote, so we go straight to the facts. And we say, this is what's going on. And even if you package it nicely, people are like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. No. So there is something to be said, if all else fails, about a one-to-one -one meeting and having that conversation, leading with curiosity, leading by example, and hopefully allowing them to explore their curiosity. Because from that place, you can truly listen and be heard. But that's hard, because at the end of the day, you are not obviously in control in any way, shape, or form how someone else chooses to participate in a conversation. But by framing it this way, hopefully it creates a space that makes it easier to have those conversations. That makes sense. The microphone is just there. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you mentioned that you work in a design team um, with other designers. So can you share with us some of the um, like conver not conversations, but like um, challenges with communicating with designers. And um, another way to look at this is like if designers want to have something just because they're like personal feeling, how do you make them go through the user story and yeah. try to discover whether this is like actual uh, improvement for users or just their their feeling? Yeah, Long that's a very question. good question. Sorry. And I think it's one that comes up in a lot of places that we work. Um, interestingly, our team has a similar but different problem at the moment where we're trying to build UI components and the development team doesn't want to use them, which is also very interesting. And they have a good reason for that too, but that's a different story. In this case, I think it goes back to, first of all, indeed, why do they believe that that's the way to design if it's feeling-based? That plays a big part in design, but also the part that then turns it into a business case is to be able to validate those feelings. So how does validation look like where you work? Do you do user testing? Do you do um, research? Like, How do people know that their designs are right or wrong or ready for improvement? I don't think there's such a thing as wrong, I would say, necessarily. 
also when things are launched, how does stuff get measured after? And lastly, um, and this is where I think this kind of narrative helps, is at the end of the day, we're all in this together. I've spoken a lot about design and development teams and how we can sometimes feel like it's, you know, I want this, no, it should be like that. Um, but we're all making this product together. And one of our roles is to help designers be aware of the technical feasibilities of what is and isn't possible. Because sometimes as well, they think of something and they think, this is going to be great. Can't we just test it? Can't you just build it? Which is good because they push us to explore our own development capabilities and sometimes make things we didn't think were quite possible. Um, insert crazy animations. But at the same time, if they are asking for something that would take, say, six weeks to build, but an alternative version can take two weeks to build, they may not know that. And it's also our role to guide them and to be able to say things like, hey, this is a trade-off. What call are you willing to make? And possibly, that's also where product comes in, because there are priorities. And at the end of the day, there's time, budget, and money. That needs them. Budget and money are the same thing. But Time, resources, constraints, and budget, right? And so if something takes six weeks, that could take two weeks, just because of a design feeling. Perhaps that is where another call ends up being made. But again, if you're saying you're wrong, <laughs> it's not necessarily helpful. Um, and so I really, truly advocate that as developers, we should talk more about technical feasibility. Because we can look at things and see immediately, like, OK, this is going to take that long. This is a black hole. I have no idea how this will be. So I need to go and like figure that out. And then I need to write tests. And then this will go wrong. And inevitably, I will find another three bugs. So this is going to take that long. And that's just things that other people, we feel that. Right At the end of the day, we see and know that intuitively, just like designers can look at designs and know intuitively that this is probably down the right track. So how can we both level out of that intuition and talk about it in a way that we can actually get somewhere? That was a very long answer. Sorry. <laughs> All right, the mic goes in the back somehow. Uh, yeah, we should have like someone, yeah, throw it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Hello. <laughs> we hear you. Okay. Uh, my question is: um, Do you think there's a difference between written storytelling and and like told storytelling? Because, for example, when I'm getting a ticket to work on, and there's a sentence like, "As a user, I want to blah blah blah," I'm mm -hmm. annoyed by this. Yeah. I prefer facts. Just yeah. okay. This is the steps I have to do. So, do you think there's a difference between written and told? Absolutely. Um, that's why books are usually quite big because they have to describe everything that you can't see. In this case, I think it's interesting because that's where productivity comes in. I think storytelling. There is a time and a place. It is usually at times of conflict, at times that you want to relate, at times of bringing people together. But when you're trying to be productive with work, indeed, maybe perhaps you do want to have, these are the 10 things I need to do and implement to make this happen. Again, my question is then probably, how does it work between the development team and product teams? Because sometimes as well, product doesn't quite know how to break it down or how you would like to break it down. Because you might break it down to 10 steps, someone else might break it down to two, someone might do it in one commit and push it. We all work differently. Um, and I see this with PMs that I work with who are brilliant at what they do, but still every time liaise with the development teams of how would you like to receive this ticket? Because for me, I think about it in user stories. I think in terms of customer success and how, you know, how will they do? And what is it that they're looking to do? Because these are the features that we make. But we think about it in terms of technically, what do I need to be able to do to make this happen? Which is I need to write another bit on the back end or ask the back end team, I need to make this API call, I need to make this interface, I need to check this other thing, I need to write that test, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're looking at this like this user story is, quite frankly, pointless, because I still now need to go and translate this. So it's worth having a conversation. And you see, in what I just said, I'm explaining potentially your story. I don't know. I don't know you. <laughs> But the one of a developer that says, it hampers my productivity in order to be able to change context. That's my hardship. And it would be much better 
if I could work a bit more effectively my victory. So what is your standpoint? What are your hardships and what does success look like for you? And how can we find a way to work better? And that's where storytelling is effective as opposed to within a ticket where it is about productivity and outcomes. Thank you. Sure. So about that mic walking around, we will just pass it around, you know, if you see someone, just like when you're passing a ball. Uh, so if someone else has a question, go ahead. Uh, like not throw it, but move it to the front, or, or we can have one walking. I love how it's literally going back and forth. It's always nice when everybody's listening to me except one guy. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's the mic is off now. Oh no, yeah, it's no. on. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would be curious, or do you have any advice for me? For example, when after the talk, I go with my teammate, both uh, tell some story. I try to convince him with my story. He tried to convince me with uh, with his story, and then his story more convincing me because he is <laughs> a better storyteller. But. Both stories are related to the same facts, so... We'll work on you. You will win the next time. <laughs> it would be nice, but for example, it's, it's for example in the, in the day life work, so some people can explain things technically, some other can explain things more understandable, yeah. uh, but related to the same topic, for example. Yeah. So, uh, how, how would I react if I think in the first side, oh, his story actually more convincing, my architecture is actually bullshit. <laughs> So there, there are two things I'd like to call out there. One is it isn't necessarily always about winning. I'm not saying that is for you. I just mean in general. And again, that's where the other element, showing up with curiosity, is really important. Because it's true. By the end, you might be convinced that the other architecture is better. And that's what I meant with the stories have the power to change stories. Um, namely, the one that you've been telling yourself about this architecture is awesome. Now I'm not so sure. But to go back to the point of being a better storyteller, I think that's where these skills are important. And I will be honest, I'm nervous every single time I stand in front of a developer conference and I talk about this stuff, because it's wishy-washy, right? And I cannot tell you the amount of times people have come up to me and said, are you sure you're a developer? Like, do you actually write code? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I just don't talk about it, because I think these are skills that we need to cultivate and work on. True, we may not excel in them, and at the end of the day, the 80% of what we do is writing robust, you know, great code. That is what we're there to do, to fix, you know, make sure it's not buggy, that it ships, and that it works, and that hopefully it's a delight to use. But in order to do that, in a way, in order to do our jobs right, we need to learn all of these other skills. And I think communication and storytelling is one of them. And so all I can say is it's something that you practice. You probably won't get it right the first time. I definitely didn't. I'm still working on it. But over time, it pays off so much, and in so many more ways than one. It's not just at work, it's with your friends, it's with other endeavors. If you do start a Swift podcast or an open source library, there, any marketing that you do is effectively storytelling. Um, if you look at Seth Godin's work, it's all about that. So I'm thinking it's just a, set, a practice and a skill that we all need to develop, and it will serve as well if you choose to put that effort and energy into it. So we still have time for Q&As, so just hold your question, just take the mic already. But before, I will do some kind of little break, because I promised you that I will introduce you to someone, uh, because we spoke a little bit about design, and because you spoke about all those, um, all those nice movie things they saw, and I'm seeing Felix, so I want you to come in the room. Um, Felix, come inside, <laughs> because this is 50% come here. Just because this guy is 50% of the responsibility of those um, amazing movie posters that you see. So it's it used to be my colleague as a designer. Yeah, give him a round of applause. So, yeah. And yeah, this is an idea we had at 7P for many years, but I'm happy that they finally made it this time. And so you will say thank you for us to the other 50% uh, of the team, right? Yeah, of course. It's, uh, it was me and my colleague Oliver, and uh, yeah, what can I say? It was just very much fun. So uh, you're welcome. <laughs> so if you have any question about those great movie posters, he's findable. I would say the guy with the beard. 
Uh, yeah, and so, oh, and by the way, um, before I release you, um, any of those badges which are black are people from Seven Principles. Um, so, yeah, if you have any question about, like, where's the toilet, um, <laughs> they know it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you're free again, and we can, like, um, go on further on the Q&As. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, hey. Does it work? Yeah, yes. uh, I have a question about. Uh, Just your mic like this. They, they think you're a rapper. Yeah. Always work. <laughs> I have a question about uh, verifying that uh, the storytelling is working or not. Like it's easier when you have like one-on-one -on -one storytelling. Yeah. But when you have a bigger audience, uh, do you have any ideas on how to verify that it's gonna work or it's gonna communicate what I want to communicate? Not that uh, I told the story, but people got something else than what I actually wanted to convey. What is the story you're trying to tell in this example? Is it in this context? Is it a bigger meeting? What are you imagining? Uh, let's just say in your example of a keyboard that mm -hmm. you wanted to show that uh, people were having a hard time because uh, the keyboard layout was uh, not intuitive. Mm -hmm. What if the person you are trying to communicate it with thing that uh, uh, people are just stupid or some other reason, for example. Well, it's interesting because that's given you another piece of information now, which is that they think it's their fault, right? The user's fault that they're stupid yeah. in this example, for example, which is a very common thing a lot of people think and say, right? Um, first of all, that's bad business because if we just all go around blaming our customers as to why they can't use what we do, well then nobody's, nobody's gonna use our stuff and ultimately we don't have a job, so it's also in our interest <laughs> to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, the way to know whether it lands is to watch, I think, their reaction and also indeed what they say next. If it is a defensive reaction such as, but they are just this, we're back to essentially facts, right? And they're refusing to hear that. But I can tell you, more often than not, that's not the case. Because, interestingly enough, and, and one of the first talks I gave was called Users Don't Bite. And it was around trying to get developers to actually watch people user test the code that they wrote. And I used to say, there's nothing like watching people struggle with the stuff that you've built and the amount of personal responsibility that you feel. Anyone in this room who's actually seen people struggle with stuff that they've worked on can relate, I think. And that's it, then there's no turning back. Like, I have seen that time and again, where first it's like, oh, but it's the user's fault, and I know I wrote this well, and it's just a bug, but we can fix it later, et cetera. And then you see it, and you're like, I have a personal responsibility to fix this. I can, I can actually improve someone's day. Why wouldn't I do that? And that's the power of the storytelling, right? And when you have a bigger audience, it is, just about seeing what's that outcome and then guiding them through that as to why is this coming up for people. And also for yourself, as to the point earlier, how can I maybe tell this differently next time? But I don't think there's necessarily a difference one-to-one -one as there is one-to-many. Um, that's why we have films and we all go to the cinema and we sit there. And sure enough, not every single person will laugh at your joke, right? A comedian can stand there and not everyone's gonna laugh. But the majority will and you can tell. So. That's how you know whether it lands or not, I would say. Thank you. Sure. All right, next one. It's funny because we have been speaking a lot, uh, so if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, but we've been speaking a lot about uh, remote working and telling mm -hmm. stories, and I think one of the reasons why my colleagues loved that I do remote office uh, is because when I'm at the office, I tell actually too many stories. <laughs> There is that. So, yeah, that's why we have headphones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, uh, I have one myself, actually, is like um, telling stories. One of the one of the, the way we have to debug stuff sometimes is by using uh, rubber duck uh, debugging. So who knows, show of hands, who knows what, what I mean when I speak about rubber duck um, debugging? Like half of it. For the, for the other ones, it's like you're basically telling your problem to someone. Like get a hold on someone, ideally another developer, but if it's randomly uh, somebody coming in the room, how much of this is like, it's, it's crazy. Like every time we tell a story, we fix the bug. <laughs> it clicks. Yeah. yeah, so what 
can, can you explain this? Like, uh, like I mean, you. You've probably done some very scientific research on the Of course, I have subject. a PhD in psychology yeah, and bug fixing and, and rubber, rubber ducking. ducking, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I don't, no. before people think that. <laughs> um, I think it is the fact that we restructure stuff in our head and then it, it does click because at the end of the day, we draw connections and lines between different things. And oftentimes, when we are looking at bugs, we can't see that connection. And by needing to explain it, you automatically put an order to it, yeah. right? It's the exact same with um, teaching things, causes you to learn something much better. So you can do something, but being able to teach something takes it to the next level because you need to know how to now explain it to someone else such that they can follow step by step kind of what's going on. So you're putting a methodology to it, and I think that's just what it is. Okay. Um, and sometimes it's also context switching, so you might draw something, you might go to a different space, and it kind of reshuffles things as well. But that's my um, uneducated opinion about this. All right, so thank you very much. Um, let's give her another round of applause, please.